This is a video of interest to anyone, since sooner or later anyone, young or old, could one day consider building a house. There are so many ways to build a house regrettably, and countless examples of this can be found scattered all around the world, as this tends to be the rule, not the exception. However, you can also do it right, and this is what we will examine in this video. A permaculture-minded house is the answer, especially if you care about the future and its challenges. The permaculture house is a central building of the farm, where the humans will dwell. The attributes any design will have to have in order to qualify for a good permaculture-minded structure are the following. Fuel economy during the cold months, a cool temperature during the hot months, relatively low building cost, high functionality of house spaces and, my personal favorite, low to no maintenance requirements in time and money. Depending on the property the house is situated on, there might also be requirements of security and privacy as well, which are good to have and not need either way, even if you think you will never need them. Therefore, we will examine some house types and why they fail or succeed as permaculture housing, and then we will attempt to construct the ideal permaculture housing based on the successful building types. Type 1. Leather tents, such as the tipi and the yurt. The Mongols used them and they were fine, right? So why not use them too? Well, the Mongols were also constantly dressed in furs for the entirety of winter and were never taking them off. So unless someone plans to be buried beneath three layers of fur during winter, I would advise against the leather or fabric construction, even if its cost and ease of building is indeed attractive. Type 2. Anything made of wood. I know a lot of people will not like what I'm about to say, because wood is indeed a very natural and very beautiful material, renewable and all that, but I'm a man of logic and my logic compels me to say that wood also has many flaws as a building material. It warps, it splits and it decays. Therefore it needs a lot of time-consuming processing, drying and then eternal maintenance. The high maintenance part is already a deal breaker for me, but let's proceed to some other flaws of wood. It is not a very good choice when it comes to natural disasters. Houses made of wood burn down. They also get smashed to pieces by hurricanes and, as I am a Greek, living in a country where everything is built of reinforced concrete pillars and floors and brick walls in between, it always fascinated me that, for example, in the US, wooden houses are so prevalent when they have hurricanes that can literally pick them up and drop them somewhere else. I made peace with this grim reality by assuming that it's probably that wood is very cheap and the constructors there are trying to make a bigger profit. So I would say wood is out too, at least for the entirety of the house. Type 3. Earth bugs, cob, rammed earth and other hippie building methods. I admit it, I am guilty of also having fallen into that trip of dreaming and watching video after video and reading article after article about building with straw bales, mud and stuff like that. However, having a family really alters your perspective on things and one thing I know is that I wouldn't be willing to put my family under a domed roof made of bags of soil. You know, when people discover these methods they get super excited and sometimes logic goes flying out of the window. I've done that too, but at least I'm very inclined towards revising my views on things when logic pushes me to that direction, so I no longer have any illusions. Yes, it is very appealing to find out that there are ways to build a house that bypass the need for a roof, which is one of the most expensive parts, and which are using earth in bags for walls, offering a lot of thermal mass and reducing the building cost to a very low standard, but when all is said and done, I would prefer to be beneath a concrete ceiling during any natural disaster than anything made of bags of soil held together with barbed wire and chicken wire. I know there are cob buildings that still stand after centuries in parts of the world, but they stand after constant maintenance, while for example military bunkers from reinforced concrete are hard to freaking remove even if you want to. Not that I'm suggesting living in one, I'm just comparing the earth bug and cob building safety and permanent standards to their extreme opposite to make a point. Straw bale building goes right out of the window. The notion is simply ridiculous. 
Yes, incredible insulation, but unless you're living in the most dry climate possible and the bales are protected, even the smallest crack in the plaster, which is bound to happen a lot since underneath you just have straw to support it, will be a great entryway for water or even environmental humidity, causing the walls of your structure to rot slowly or in a hurry, depending on the moisture that gets in. Building something I will have to rebuild after a while isn't worth the superb insulation it offers in my book. With earthbags, my research shows that a lot of domes have collapsed, as they apparently only do well in very dry climates, but they collapse in climates with lots of rain. Also, square earthbag houses have an innate issue with walls collapsing, regardless of weather. However, from whatever research I managed to make, the shape that stands in regards to earthbag houses is a roundhouse, but not domed, with a normal roof sitting on it. But roundhouses create very impractical spaces on the inside, so it's a pass for me. As regards cob, I think it could work, but it also shouldn't get too wet or parts of it may collapse as well, as it has happened in many cases. You may think that a good roof will do the trick, but there can and have been rainstorms with constant rain beating the building sideways, and you really can't prevent that if it's about to happen. Some cases of collapsed cob houses were after heavy rainstorms of the sort. So I wouldn't trust this either, maybe some cob parts on the inside of a house would be okay, but not the exterior walls, or anything load-bearing would be safe enough for me. Type 4. Conventional buildings, at least the way they make them here. Let me tell you a short story of the way things are built here in Greece. It starts with a reinforced concrete foundation, on which a skeleton of reinforced concrete pillars, beams, floors and stairways is erected and the walls of which are built with bricks, the type with many holes, not the solid bricks. Then they use polystyrene insulation boards on the outside to seal the building and plaster over all the walls inside and out. The workers typically make a sloppy job of covering everything with the polystyrene, leaving a lot of thermal bridges from which heat easily escapes in winter and enters in the summer, because the contractor who hired them doesn't care and wants them to work fast. It's not his family that will live in there anyway, and the thickness of the boards that is universally used is also far from adequate for perfect insulation, because, again, the contractor will do the absolute minimum, and if he can get away with it, even less. So, you end up with a hopeless building that gets baked in the summer, frozen in the winter, and in which you cannot live unless it has got an air conditioning system in the summer and some way of hitting it hard in the winter. While some of these building ideas have their merit, concrete skeleton, brick walls, outside insulation and plastering, it is far from the most efficient method of building something pleasant and economical to live in. Type 5. Stone buildings. Now we're starting to get somewhere. Stone is a great building material, found almost anywhere in great abundance. It is aesthetically very beautiful and thick stone walls add enormously to the thermal mass of a house. However, there is a myth going around and that is the myth that stone offers great insulation. This couldn't be further from the truth. The insulation of stone is almost as bad as that of concrete. And that means it's really, really bad, almost non-existent. The illusion of good insulation is given because of high thermal mass of stone walls, which means that it absorbs heat during the day, so it takes some time until it saturates and starts radiating it, and then gives it off during the night, when it's cooler, so people tend to think that this is the result of insulation. It very definitely is not. You will understand this a lot better if you have a very hot day followed by a very hot night, so that this back and forth in temperature won't exist. The house will then be an oven, regardless of the stone, whereas a building with very high insulation could have managed to hold a relatively steady temperature, provided the windows were closed throughout the entire hellish day. However, stone is not a choice I would exclude from building a permaculture-oriented house. It would just have to be combined with some bioclimatic or passive house techniques such as deciduous trees shading the house in the summer but dropping their leaves in the winter so that the sunlight can warm the house up, roofs with such an angle that provides shade in the summer's vertical sunlight but not in the winters when the sun is lower, solar chimneys with pipes that draw air from the outside and cool it underground to 15 degrees Celsius before it reaches the house's interior and for the winter a good rocket mass heater or masonry heater would do the job. 
At this point, I need to make a comment on the mortar that is used to build stone walls in general. The only building method in the entire world that is entirely unaffected by the elements, with constructions of it still standing after even thousands of years, is dry stone walls. There are also walls standing after centuries which have been built with a kind of lime mortar that is just simply lime mixed with sand, and once built it hardens and becomes sort of like concrete, but not quite. However, in modern times, most people are building stone walls with concrete. This is not ideal, for the same reason that the dry stone walls in Mykine still stand, thousands of years later. You see, concrete is preferred because it hardens and becomes sort of like stone itself, and very firmly and powerfully holds the stones in place. However, it is waterproof. How is this a problem? It is, because stones are porous and not waterproof, and you have basically a web of waterproof concrete holding together moisture-absorbing stones. So the result is that, with all the expansions and contractions of concrete due to weather, tiny cracks open between it and the stones, atmospheric moisture gets in, and then with frost it expands and cracks the concrete and keeps degrading the concrete until serious damage is done. Lime mortar, which is more elastic than cement mortar, is also not waterproof, so it takes moisture in and breathes it out, with no damage done, especially since cracks formed on it can automatically heal. The reason why many masons prefer cement mortar is that it is much easier to build with, since the weight of the stone is supported in the concrete, while with lime mortar you need to support the weight with the other stones, and basically use the mortar as a filling material in between what would otherwise be a dry stone wall. So it's trickier and requires a lot more effort and skill. Therefore, a stone house should preferably have been built with lime mortar, which is simply lime mixed with sand, in order to not require maintenance. However, there is a better method yet, although it is not as low-tech as building with stone, but if you're willing to make use of technological advances while they're still available, it could be worth considering it. However, when you choose between the two, just consider that you are not building low-tech anymore, and are thus then very reliant on high-tech materials for repairs if any damage is done. And high-tech materials may not be available in times of crisis, which may come sooner or later anywhere in the world, and are already present in large parts of it. The sixth type of building I'm talking about is the so-called passive house. The general idea is that you create a completely enclosed house like an envelope, with no air coming in or out without you wanting it. You super-insulate it to the extent that nothing passes in or out, and then you have created a house that requires zero energy to heat or cool. You don't even need a heating system in winter to keep it warm, since the warmth from the human bodies is enough, since the insulation is so extreme that almost none of it is lost. You do, however, need to cool it down a bit during hot summers, because, again, of bodies producing heat. This can be easily done with solar chimneys, which is basically a regular pipe traveling from outside, under the ground, bringing air to the inside, cooling it passively during its transfer, because of the cool temperatures that the soil has. Then you have some chimneys in the house for passively sucking up the hot air, which goes up and releasing it, like an air conditioning unit, but for free, and with almost no maintenance required. The problem with this method is condensation in the pipes, which may lead to the formation of mold. Using smooth plastic pipes with holes in the bottom for losing the water that is produced from condensation is supposed to solve the problem, but I have not tried anything of the sort yet. I might make the experiment at some point without a house sitting on top of the pipes to know what works best before it is too late. The windows also have to be triple glazed and filled with vacuum or gas, and you should also pump foam insulation in their aluminium frames if they already don't have it, since aluminium frames will exchange heat. The insulation you will use outside the house should be of at least a specific thickness at every point, walls and roof and all, and it's better on the outside of the masonry, because then you also get the masonry as thermal mass which helps regulate temperature spikes better. I know there are many types of insulation that are eco-friendly and low-tech, 
like wool and what not. But my concern is how long they last and generally their degradation which may require repair. I personally think that regular polystyrene panels are probably the best choice, although if someone knows a better low-tech insulating material that doesn't degrade over time and stays in place, I would like to hear about it. So, this is my suggestion for building a permaculture-minded house. Either a passive house, which would be the most efficient and economical to run, or a stone house with passive house features, which would be more low-tech, easy to repair and modify, and in my opinion, more beautiful. I would love to know your thoughts on the subject. As always, thanks for watching, and see you the next time.